The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dash Technology Group, ABN 93603 824 835, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Your Next Client Is You, an ensemble podcast series dedicated to revolutionising financial advice practices with technology. Each episode, we're peeling back the layers of tech implementation, guided by the real-life experiences of a diverse group of advice practitioners. Whether you're tech-savvy or just beginning, they've been where you are, researching, choosing, and triumphing in the tech maze. So, are you ready for insights and inspiration to revamp your practice? Then let's dive in. Are you looking to introduce unprecedented efficiency in your practice? Dash solves the entire spectrum of advice delivery, allowing you to streamline your practice in ways you haven't been able to before. Automate your execution from customized websites to CRMs, modeling, and SOA generation, executed straight into the Dash investment platform. We offer an array of in-house apps and collaborate with third-party vendors to bring you the best solutions. Curious about what your peers have accomplished in their practices with Dash and our integration partners? Have a listen to some practice insights that are sure to get you thinking. Hello and welcome to this very special Ensemble podcast mini-series where we're applying the five-stage advice process we know so very well to help you select the technology you use to serve your clients. Now, we're gaining these insights through the experience of advice practitioners all at different stages in their businesses. Um, They're from within the Ensemble network along with some insights from experts within Dash uh, I'm Peter Diamantidis, and the guests joining me here today are Andrew Grinsell from Cooey Wealth Partners and Jamie Arden from Kofkin Bond & Co. Welcome, gents. Thank you for your time. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us, Peter. All right. So this is super sad. This is the final episode of the series, um, and we're going to be focusing on this sort of ongoing management stage for you know a technology partner. Once we sort of selected them, we've implemented them. Now it's in the practice, and you know everybody's utilizing it. And it's interesting because for many of the listeners, they may actually be wondering why we have a whole episode on this, right? Because isn't the job done, right? You've implemented it. Yay, run away, be happy, enjoy, you know, get all those benefits. But part of this is about how we optimize the use of that technology on an ongoing basis. So to sort of position this, I've got a bit of a cheeky question that I haven't prepped you gents for, so I do apologize ahead of time. And I'd love the listener to think this through too, as I'm asking it. But do you both use, say, Microsoft Suite? Is that the normal thing in your practice? That's the sort of core, you know, tool for docs and, and spreadsheets and things? Yeah, absolutely. And is there one of them that you use a lot? So do you use Word or Excel, like one of them on a daily basis? Which would be the one you'd use the most, do you think? Out- Outlook for me. <laughs> Except Outlook. We're all living yeah. in our new boxes. Don't be far out. Although Outlook is not a bad example. How about you, Andrew? We would spend a lot of time in Excel, Uh there are just things that we like to test and run through on cool. right scenarios where the modeling software sort of it jumbles everything together. So it makes it a bit hard to see the individual attribution of different strategies. So we do yep. spend a lot of time in Excel with In Excel, strategies. cool. So when we think about how much time we spend in those tools, I guess I'm curious for either of you, whether you remember the last time you did any formal training on either of those. Like, do you remember ever doing... Like year 12, so you were right, like 10 plus years ago, yeah. And and year 10 computer studies, something right. like that. And yeah. I mean, it's true. We'd all say that, right? Except these are things that are fundamental to how we do, you know, run our day to day. And so it's a great example to me of how we're probably not ever really embedding these things and making sure we continue to get value. You know, we're not checking back in and getting updated constantly. So it's just sort of my tri- cheeky way to sort of highlight that, that there's more to do than just that initial learning about something. Um, so that brings us to our discussion today on the projects you guys have been working on. And we have covered this in the previous four episodes and you guys are probably <laughs> feel like you, you're you repeating yourselves, but just so the listener gets on the same page, Andrew, tell us what was the tech solution you were looking for? What was the work you were trying to you know get done in, with this project? 
First thing for us was to look for a CRM that we could use across all parts of our business, uh, whereas previously we were using a, a financial planning CRM and trying to make our property and accounting and mortgages teams all work out of that, and it, it just doesn't work for them. So, uh, And they had their own CRMs as well, so it was double entry of data across everything. So uh, what we were looking for was a CRM uh, that we could use across the whole business, and uh, that led us down the path of picking uh, a CRM that is a CRM only. Uh, so FIN365 only aims to be a CRM. It doesn't try to do everything else. And then we, we connect that up with um, my dash to be able to get access to the, the document generation, the, um, the modeling, the product research, uh, and, and we're down that path. Awesome. And so, Jamie, similarly for you, what was the sort of problem you're solving or the tech solution you're looking for and what did you end up choosing? Yeah, so looking for open architecture. So as as a growing firm, sort of looking to add, add different advisories to that, um, we need to find a system that could help us move data. So we landed on Dash um, and using all the sort of, you know, um, I guess apps that they have within the system. So, you know, there's a lot of technology going on, but we're using sort of the one interface to integrate with them all. And that's an interesting thing that um, both of you have done there, even though you've come at it in the end from different avenues, is it's almost finding something that can either has – its own integrations available, which is what Dash does. Like they've got those internal, all those apps, you know, that you can get access to, or something else that then integrates with something like a Dash, so that then you know it all talks to to each other. So that's something that clearly you've both sort of hunted down was that sort of being able to plug and play different um, apps into your ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Just being able to pick sort of best in breed for each part of the advice technology stack uh, was important to us as well. So uh, that's what we were able to achieve with the path or the direction we went. Yes. And same with us. It's, yeah. Same with us. It's, I guess it's the point of if, if something stops working or they're not developing or they reach the early and we find something else, oh, I wanted a sort of application that allows us to sort of you know, swap and change but not lose our set of data and not have to sort of migrate that data across. Yeah. Perfect. So how long ago – actually, I'm curious. So, Andrew, how long ago did you sort of finish the initial implementation of that project? I wouldn't say it's actually huh? finished. Uh, <laughs> see, the thing is – with we've, we've used obviously Fin three six five, which is built on the Microsoft Dynamics um, sales platform, and uh, I think everyone knows obviously Microsoft is doing a lot of development, especially with their um, open AI yes. uh, partnership that they have there. So literally every month there's a new set of product release or updates that come through, which is something that we want to be able to utilize, like um, you know automating. Um, file notes, all those sort of things. So um, we haven't finished and I I don't know that we would finish. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How about, so Jamie, when was the, like you did that sort of what sounds like a data transfer actually is that first hurdle. When did that, when did you guys do that step for for moving into Dash? Uh, I'm unsure on time, I'm trying to think now, but uh, around 18 months to two years ago. Okay. Um, So one of of the earliest adopters in that regard. Yep. Sort of data across. Yep. Now, and now that's interesting too, just, I mean, I don't have this in our questions, but I think one of the fears some advisors do have is being one of the early movers because there's so much new technology, isn't there? Like there really is, as evidenced by the fact I can host a podcast every week with a new piece of tech that I'm talking about, right? So clearly there's lots. How did you, was was that a concern for you being an early adopter or what gave you comfort? To, to enable yourself to go, you know what, this isn't too big a risk for the business. Yeah, I, I'd been an early adopter on another piece of technology before. Um, I sort of don't need to talk about it. I was, but um, yeah, with Dash, the confidence for me come with the team. So yeah. like, I, I can't speak more highly of their team. And, you know, the confidence come that I'd found a partner that was actually going to listen to sort of our feedback. So I wasn't speaking to someone that was sort of, you know, gets put in a support call and sort of pushed to the back. Uh, I was able to sort of talk to their team and try to, guide what we were looking for and if it made sense for their product then we sort of headed that way so that confidence for me um being an early adopter i think is a good thing if if it's done in the right sort of set of circumstances so yeah you know if you're working with someone and you truly trust and believe in then you're obviously working towards a goal um if you've sort of got reservations of who you're working with and don't think they're sort of gonna help get that process and then that's something i've been through before then you know i'd probably say hold back a little bit yeah look and i've been through a similar journey you know i and and it it's all learning, but um, I'm with you. And look, one of the other factors actually that that I now measure is like, what's their quantum? You know, are we looking at somebody that's a, a tiny startup or is it actually a broader business really? And so therefore their longevity is, is likely because that's a risk for all of us. 
you know, I've been part of one, you know, a, a, a tech tool that's now basically disappeared. So, so I think, and and Dash has that, doesn't it? So it's sort of got that size and weight. Um, so you don't yeah. need to have that fear. So we we joined them when they were raw consulting. So yeah, so and they've been around a while actually. Is that so? It's Correct. yeah, yeah. All right. So now that well. At least the early data transfer was has been implemented, Andrew, and, and you, you did complete that first part. Absolutely, yeah, up and running. Yeah, yeah, sure. you're, exactly. So the practice is using it and it's sort of living yeah. and breathing in the practice. I'm curious what benefits you are hoping to see initially and whether you actually saw those benefits. We're certainly seeing a, a lot of improvement in the, the time that takes to um, you know, complete data entry and build client files, all those sort of things. We're not duplicating the use of support resources, uh, which, which is great. And it means that the support staff now sort of move further up the value chain and do things that are you know, a bit more productive within the business, which is fantastic. Uh, it also means that their roles are less mundane than what they may have been in the past. They get a bit yep. more variety. Uh, they can be challenged a little bit more in what they're doing rather than just doing, you know, data entry and, you know, looking at bank statements and keying in lines and things like that. So yeah. we've certainly had that. Um, there's also um, a lot more business intelligence that we do have now. Uh, we, we get to understand more around, um, you know, what is it that our clients are using across the b- broader Kui group. Um, our financial advisors or wealth partners, as, as we call them, can see uh, you know what's going on with a client who might have something for the property team or the mortgage team or the accounting team, whereas previously they just had no visibility. So be able to actually know where everything's up to for the client and act really as sort of like the, the project manager or the hub right. uh, in that client advisor and other professional role uh, has certainly eventuated. Uh, and look, I think there's going to be more that we're going to be able to get out of it as we keep moving through this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and on that vein, then I'm curious, do you see potentially the skills your staff are going to need are going to change? Because some of what you might have hired them when they were doing a lot of, say, data entry or, or double entry was like, you know, is focusing maybe on that accuracy over some other skill that might be a softer skill. Are you thinking you might need to evolve the team's skills as you respond to the different tasks they're going to end up doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh they may move you know, more from a, um, a client sort of or financial planning assistant role more into like a client service manager type role over time. So um, starting to actually get them being able to contact clients and you know, book in the review meetings, obtain documentation that we need and actually um, assist the, the wealth partners with uh, communicating with clients and, and following things up certainly uh, is something that we, we want to look at, whereas that's not what they originally came on board for, <laughs> but they really like that side of the role. They, they enjoy yeah, dealing with the clients and everything. And you know, they, they do have really good interpersonal skills. It's just something that will then just sort of work with them and, and introduce them to over time. And that frees up our wealth partners to spend more time on the, the real in-depth client advice discussions and working on their strategies, uh, which is quite important for us. So, Jamie, for you then, now you know, you're know you well into this, when you first sort of completed the project and the move across I'm curious for you, what were the benefits you were hoping to see initially and did you see that? Like, was it what you expected as it rolled out? Yeah, it was. So, and I guess I'll touch on a couple of points. I'll probably jump ahead and sort of combine it all into the one, but we actually sort of seen the movement around um, uh, the professional year and bringing young advisors through our practice. So, right. we actually sort of redesigned roles around the technology that we were using. So, during some of the podcasts, we've talked about you know, using different bits of technology to complete parts of the process. So we've actually sort of designed roles where it's not a sort of factory line of what it's going through, but, you know, our when we have our sort of advice associates or people going through a professional year, they're actually working on the strategy in part of that process and the modeling. So, you know, as they're sort of going through those file notes, they're sort of putting that straight into strategy. So when you talk about your traditional power planners, they're not getting handed over a sheet of paper to tell them what the strategy is and they're starting to write it. You know, that's already sitting there within the system for them. So I've really found we're not doubling up on that same information continuously. You know? yeah. So you know, we, we, our dream was to always push and pull data and that's what Dash allowed us to do. Um, and then what we were able to do is model our processes around, well, you know, our advisors can start using the technology early so by the time that it comes to the modeling and the research, that whole strategy is already in there. So, you know, my technical team are picking up on the strategies there, they're modeling and they're sort of mashing all together. So that's sort of been a really big time saver for us. And it's just not doubling up on that, the the existing or the old style of, you know, writing a power planning request. 
Yeah. Well, but also I think, um, you know, if we if we get clever with the way we use technology, people can become, I hesitate to use the word functional, but when you get somebody new, and let's talk new as in, you know, professionally new, so quite green, yep. you can get them adding value a lot faster if you design that tech well. You know, they can have an impact as opposed to way back when, when really you could have somebody for months and months and months before they were really having any impact on any actual, you know, business that was going on. So it's interesting to hear you say that, in fact, that this move has caused you to sort of change some of that so that you can get that value faster. Yeah, and like I think with the with the staff as well is they they're learning the soft skills from seeing him with the advisor, and yeah, you know, that's where they're actually sort of learning those skill sets from. But then when we talk around the technical skills, if they can see them continuing to write strategies as well as modeling as part of that process, they're sort of they're really picking up on the technical side pretty quickly. So yeah. when they're delivering advice, they're sort of knowing their mind how that modeling is going to work. So I think it's also fast track their knowledge within the space as well. It's interesting too. I mean, the great the great thing that I, I see coming out of a lot of the tech that's very advice tech, right? So we're talking deep into into strategy modeling is um, they're building in these guardrails, you know, where it's sort of once the data, if the, if you've got great client data, it's almost sort of taking out a whole lot of things that would never apply and pointing the advisor towards things they need to consider or opt out of. Do you know what I mean? So it really, from a training perspective. Um, that's wonderful structure because it lets them sort of learn on the job and learn within themselves. I think we always lose. I mean, I know I learn better by, you know, working on something myself than I do somebody talking at me. Yeah. Um, so I'm imagining the more you go down this path, the more you'll be able to get that benefit um, where somebody can sort of learn in the job as they go. Yeah. And I think it helps, you know, all staff are feeling like they're interacting together. Like, you know, we always talk about, everyone talks about coming together and collaborating. Well, I think we've really built that within our firm by using that technology. We're, we're using sort of all different bits and it all sort of comes together as one um, by the end of that process. So, yeah, that's something we worked hard on. To that end then, Andrew, I'm curious, um, you've mentioned uh, Trainual. Am I saying that the right way? Um, yeah, that's right. As, yeah, so, and I'm imagining almost like your intranet in that it's the how we do things um, and the place people can yep. find out and get and get training. Yep. Is having something like that and and building it almost alongside you going on this enormous project because you had to, as there was so much learning for all the team yep. across the practice, has that sort of given you more confidence for the next round of hires you might do? Like, are you feeling like you're going to be able to get them powering faster, if you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll get them, uh, you know, next time we go and we increase our team, we'll certainly get them up to speed quicker for a few reasons. We've certainly built out our training library through Trainual. Uh, with, you know, it's a combination of written um, you know, policies, procedures, how-tos, along with video explainers, all sorts of things. But we've also become, uh, or we've specialised the roles just a little bit more. So that allows our um, you know, different team members to really focus on um, probably fewer areas, but be much more, um, become more specialist in those areas. So uh, otherwise you, you sort of end up with generalists who um, don't really have any deep knowledge in a particular area. So yeah. uh, you know, some of the sort of things that we're, we're talking about at the moment for next time we go and hire is, you know, do we have a, a specialist technical role or someone who is you know, really sitting there doing all of the, the financial modelling rather than trying to get all of our advisors to be doing it? Because sometimes they can get lost for hours in trying to work out how to do trust distributions and you know, allocate to a company and what if the client's got a Div 7A loan and overcomplicating things. Whereas if you've got someone who does a lot of modelling, they can probably get to it a bit quicker. Also, though, think about the time, like, I mean, you know, my background is in actuarial studies, right? And so, and I started out as a financial analyst in corporate finance. And when I think about the people that really resonated with that role, they were not the person you'd then necessarily have going out and pitching or engaging or or coaching or facilitating, you know? So actually yeah. by starting to, um, to narrow down those roles, you get somebody who really loves just doing that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I get really, they'd love it. So I'm yeah. Wondering whether that part of that evolution has also happened because this move caused you to get really granular on your processes again. Like you sort of really looked at what the functions were and what everybody was doing in a really specific sense, as opposed to generally, hey, you're admin, off you go and do admin stuff. Well, that's it. I mean, over time, you just end up doing things because that's how you've always done it. And then if you go and completely rip up your advice tech stack and start again, it means that you've actually got to sit down and plan out, well, how are we going to do things now? Yeah. And uh, you do find that you might have um, the you know, some really good people, but doing the you know, a role that's not right for them. And, yeah. you know, well, actually, what, what should you be doing? And better aligning that, uh, looking at 
things that we were doing that were just wastage. Like there's a, a lot of things we found in our advice process that were quite time consuming. So they were adding cost to the delivery of advice, but maybe it wasn't adding value for the clients. Yeah. Uh, and then we also found other areas where you know we we could add value quite efficiently and effectively. So a lot of that was redesigned through this process. Which is exciting, and it's it's it is a bit perpetual um, <laughs> that process. But I guess I'm curious for each of you before we sort of get to how the the suppliers have supported you from an ongoing sense. I am curious, you know, if you look further down the road, um, you know, that you've laid some great groundwork, each of you, with the sort of projects you've embarked on. Where are you seeing this going? You know, what are the other benefits you'd hope to get down the track or other enhancements you might make down the track? Jamie, where, where do you see that going for you guys? Well, I think similar to where Andrew sort of got to with his team, you know, is looking to pull on other departments. It's about understanding what they need. Um, yeah. So really mixing that together well. But yeah, I think we're in a world where there's so much technology coming out at the moment. So it, it, the, the vision, I don't think it goes too far. Um, you know, our vision is to sort of look what's ahead of us um, and make some key decisions, but also look to what we want to be as, as a firm. So, yeah. you know, we're continuously, and that's why we sort of look to that open architect. So if there is something that comes on and creates a vision for us, we can move in that direction. We're not going to keep pivoting. Um, we, we understand where we want our business to look like and the information that we want from our business, um, but we you know, try to keep that vision quite tight in what we're after. And would you say, Andrew, that's the same for you? So it's really like you've got the core nailed now. It's just down to how, what maybe you want to offer to clients or or how those things evolve that might define what you plug and play yeah. down the track. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's other things that we've got to look at, like uh, client portals. Uh, we, we have one at the moment. Uh, we've got to have a look at how that you know, is actually you know, engaging with our clients or how we're engaging with our clients through it. And that's something that we want to be able to plug in to the tech stack. And um, yeah, it, it's probably the next stage of building out what we're doing. Uh, the other thing that we're, we're looking at is um, there's a lot of customizations you can make with the um, the CRM that we've chosen. And uh, we're, we're looking at putting on a part-time developer to be able to continue to work with us in that space so that we can... Uh, you know, start to automate a few things that we are currently doing manually, and uh, if we can, we can sort of start to automate that and take human hours out of it. It frees that up for more time engaging with our clients, improving the service and the you know the, the advice that we provide, uh, and you know, being able to have each of our wealth partners potentially handle more clients. So uh, we're certainly not not stopping with where we are, and uh, we've got quite a bit that we we want to roll out. But I bet now that you've gone to the trouble of, like you say, sort of ripping ripping it all up and starting again and laying out those processes, it becomes easy to identify what you would want to automate, whereas you probably would have had trouble enunciating that before this whole process. Uh, even being able to do it. I mean, if, <laughs> you know, in the old CRM, uh, one of, it's you know, one of the more established and um, incumbent players. It's, no, no, this is, uh, their, their view is, this is it. You you want to change something too bad. We, we won't change it for you. Uh, you yeah. can't have a customized version of it. Whereas uh, the Microsoft Dynamics um, sales platform effectively can be customized with all sorts of you know, different things that you can do where you're, you're automating different parts of the client engagement process and uh, that's certainly something that we've got to map out. Well, what are the parts that we uh, can automate that are um, quite time consuming at the moment and uh, but without taking away the personal touch, got to be quite careful with yeah. with finding that. Um, so, yeah, certainly it's an opportunity that we now have that we, we couldn't even entertain on the last CRM. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And it's um, what we've found too is when you look at what you can automate, sometimes some of the best value is actually in the internal handover. We've actually spent time with that automation, you know, so even ha- having somebody that, that is really, you know, more like a reception or call taker, being able to f- complete an internal form that points the actions to the right person and it all just gets automated. They don't need to try and remember that so-and-so does this and so, you know, it all just does that. Some of those things can just save inordinate amounts of effort. And time, so we we probably all focus on automation sometimes from a client perspective. You know, like we oh send that thing out automatically, but sometimes it's all internal. You know, and you've got a big team, so I'd imagine there could be some value um, from that for sure. Now, in terms of then the support you've had, so um, you know each of the suppliers can be a bit different, but I'm interested, Jamie, from your perspective. You know, the ongoing either training, materials, resources. It sounds like you have an ongoing sort of relationship with Dash, who you selected for, you know, for all this project. 
what did they have available that you found really like what what really worked for you aside from maybe that just the people you could interact with? Yeah, look, I, I think it's sort of getting responses quick, um, which is a big part for me. So as I said, I've got a great relationship with Kevin and the team, and, and they've done a lot of work. But you know, even setting time where we were sort of having some ideas around what we th- thought might be good with the modelling through Archer. Um, sent them an email of, you know, these are some of the things we're working with. And, and they took that as a, yep, actually, that's something we can be interested in having a look at. You know, had a meeting with them today, actually, this morning. And it's the same thing. It's like, yeah, this is what we're seeing. And then it was, I would actually have a conversation. Well, why are you actually trying to achieve that? And, and what use is that going to have within your business? So it, uh, I've sort of talked in previous podcasts about it, it's good to have a sounding board of, you know, are you trying to chase something that's not actually relevant or going to provide, you know, your clients with the best outcomes? Yeah. Is that just a really good idea you have? And then from a tech and development point, does it work as well? So, so is it possible? Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. it possible? You know, we, I think as advisors, everybody's AI and all this stuff. And AI sure. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, AI and automated processing. It's, you know, there's different things happening. But yeah, that's where I felt the support is there. Um, you know, and I understand that sort of the larger we get and everything moves together and you know, the more work that they're doing and things like that, it becomes harder to keep that sort of touch. But that's something they've kept going the entire time um, and that's where I think a real strength of, of that platform's been. And that's an interesting um, measure, isn't it? Because uh, if I think of fund managers, then we would all um, expect that most, you know, the fund managers we engage with or utilise would check in with us um, and, you know, maybe have a meeting and give us an update. Like that's all part of that model, you know, so it's quite normal. Yeah. Whereas we probably haven't set that expectation for our tech. We probably haven't thought, you know what, I should be having a check in with these people once in a yeah. while. And you're like, so it's interesting that, that, you know, we use the tech as much as we use the funds. So surely we should apply that same sort of rigor or structure to keeping up to date and getting their feedback, like you're saying. And, and with tech moving so quick, I think it's very important. You know, they're, they're making updates on a daily basis um, with their team. So I, I couldn't agree more. So, Andrew, for you then, um, and in fact, you have you have a couple of um, providers that you've then implemented. How did you see, like, what were the differing resources you guys use on an ongoing sense? Do you mainly use some training or the materials they provide? What are the, What's the support that you take advantage from, you know, of from the providers? Yeah, so we uh, we have a monthly catch up with uh, some key people at uh, Dash as well. Uh, obviously, because we're using that for for part of our tech solution there, and uh, we do talk through you know what we're trying to achieve as a business, what we want to see from our technology, and uh, they have implemented uh, a few of those things that uh, we've provided or requested, and they sort of yeah, you know, so they are quite um, good at collaborating with their advisors and uh, building uh, building their tech solution around what advisors actually want and need, yeah. uh, which has been fantastic. Uh, then from the, the CRM perspective where we're over with um, Fin365, uh, we've been you know, probably every fortnight, uh, at least every month, we've been in contact with them and, and had meetings around where we're at with the um, obviously the implementation and uh, ongoing benefits that we're deriving and talking to them about the the challenges that that we face with the business and uh, they've made some adjustments and customizations. Uh, if ever we're stuck on anything, uh, there's generally a video that sort of explains how to do it. And if there isn't, uh, normally within about forty eight hours, they've recorded a video explaining how to do whatever we were stuck on, and it's in the training library for us. So uh, that's been really quite helpful because obviously once the video is there it, it's available um, and I find the videos are a bit better to follow than written training guides sometimes Yeah, because uh, you can sort of have the video on one screen watching what they're doing and have it live on your other screen and sort of go through it and follow it and go yep okay good it worked yeah. uh, so that's been really quite helpful but uh, it's still evolving at such a fast pace like there's, there's so many product releases and updates and everything that come out and uh, yeah, they've been quite good at explaining to us, well, you know, in your business, you could um, use this and it'll help you achieve, you know, X, Y, Z problem that you've raised with us in the past. That was going to be my next question, actually, for each of you. And we'll start with yeah. you, Andrew, since you're on that topic is, you know, these feature releases, it's, I mean, I remember in the old days when you might get them once a quarter, you know, if that, right, we'd just get a list of like five bullet points. Hey, this is what we've updated for whatever system you're in. Now it's just this constant stream of things that are being updated and and upgrades or changes how so it sounds like in in your reg, regular interaction that's how you're sort of being you know aware of those i'm curious how you're then ensuring they're disseminated through the team so they can get the value of some of those features how do you sort of keep that 
constant update going with your team? Yeah, so uh, obviously we get updated uh, in our conversations with uh, with the providers of changes that have been made, but also release notes are generally available and they'll yeah. pop up the first time you log in after there's been a release of something. So uh, generally what will happen is I'll have a look at that and go, well, all right, how does that apply to us and what we do? And then during our uh, weekly team meetings, we'll have a look at that and um, talk through it with the team. And if there's a, a change that we want to implement to our processes or our policies as a result of those changes, we we will do it. But uh, yeah, I, I always want to get feedback from my team as well about how they see those changes being beneficial. You can't just go jumping onto and changing your policies and processes every time there's a new release on something. It, it'd never settle on anything consistently. And you'd go crazy. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So we generally want to get uh, a few members of the team to, to have a go at something that's new. One piece of software released something uh, on Monday and said that this is what it'll do for you. I went and tested it and it didn't. It didn't work. You've got to be careful not going and telling your whole team to go and start doing something when it doesn't actually work as, as intended. So we generally want to try and break it or I'll try and break it myself and then roll it out. You'll, you'll throw the sledgehammer at it, see what happens, yeah. and then, yeah, fair yeah. enough. How about for you, Jamie? What's your sort of process in terms of the releases and the upgrades, and how do we get this through to the team? Yeah, very similar to Andrew's. Um, I think the last eight was great. Well, we had to try to break it first and, and get sort of the staff members that are using it consistently. Um, so we actually get them to sort of have a look at it before we sort of start, start telling all staff about it. But we also flag as an agenda item to make sure we're talking to all staff once we've um, released and they're going down that way. We, we we sort of put it as an agenda item within our team meeting. So um, make sure people see it, um, see how we're using it, and then we sort of move on from there. So if you then, I'm curious then, um, based on what you're both saying, it sounds like where's years ago, you know, if you have a team meeting, often it's sort of like the you know, work in progress, you know, any any mark man might be a market discussion like there I mean, might be some things that you generally cover in a team meeting it sounds like both of you have tech as another item that's always on the agenda is that valid is that andrew do you guys just always end up touching on something in the team meeting from a tech perspective well we do because we're 100 percent online our entire team works from home so we are constantly in front of technology uh so it's it is a core part of what we do and Obviously, it's been a big push for us over the last 12 months with the introduction of the yeah, of new technology across the whole advice delivery process. So uh, it certainly is a standing agenda item in both the, um, the the team meeting within the wealth team, but then also the group-wide operational meeting. Uh, there's always a discussion around it, and uh, we've, you know, we've got workflow or um, task management software as well where we're sort of keeping track of the, the projects and everything and where we're at with, with that. Okay, that's important. So, so using like an Asana or an equivalent, you've got some sort of project management. Yeah, Monday.com. So Monday, we, we okay. use that to just make sure that we're tracking everything that's not generally client specific uh, yeah. and be able to really have that project management software in there because there is always a project. And the other issue that you sort of face is sometimes um, a whole lot of ideas will get thrown up uh, in a strategic planning meeting or an operations meeting, and you do have to prioritize and some yeah. You know, as as managers, we've got to try and make sure that we are only working on those things that are actually on the agenda and not getting sidetracked by the the next shiny thing that pops up in front of us. Yeah. Uh, so it's really important for us to keep a, a clear focus on what we are actually doing and not get sidetracked. Yeah, and it is though because you, you quickly discover that you, like your CRM is great, but that's client tasks. Like that's stuff for the clients, whereas all this other stuff. Is outside of that, and you need a place to have that. Um, we've got to the point where, in our version, which is Asana, which is very similar in Monday, we even have boards that are just for the ideas. You know, before they even yep. get acknowledged as projects, it's like let's just keep on collecting them because they're all awesome. Yep. But like you say, we can't do all of them, um, yep. or we'd have to stop serving clients. Yeah, um, we actually um, borrowed from uh, from what Dash do. They actually have a quarterly prioritization meeting where they get all the ideas that everyone's put forward, you know, either internal or um, what the advisors have put forward to them, and they sit down and go, "Go right, well, what are we actually going to work on for the next quarter? What what are our key projects?" Because they do have a series of project managers yeah. and devs uh, there, and they so we sort of took that approach as well, and we do that internally. How about you, Jamie? How do you handle that stuff internally on an ongoing basis so that it sort of don't get, uh, you know, attention deficit, oh, shiny? Um, yeah. things as same, same, same as you both sort of touched on. We use Trello, though. We're yep. just using Trello, same board, but 
you know, on our left hand side, we have ideas and concepts and they sort of sit there and then sort of move across the board at that time as well. But, you know, ideas and concepts can sit there for ages and keep sort of having comments under them. And then we get to a point saying, I, I actually like the idea about a quarterly meeting. We're probably just more ad hoc in the way that we're talking about it um, and working priorities, but trying to move them across the boards at all times. Yeah, and it's it's um when you do it on a more structured way like that and, and put aside some time, it also lets the debate happen in a more relaxed way. Sometimes what can happen, and I know, you know, I'm the loudmouth in the team, right? So so if we're debating it on the fly, often it'll be me, me going, well, I think it should be this, and that's what we go with, instead of having that more collaborative discussion that sometimes will draw out a project that in no way would interest me, but has huge benefit. You know, like it's that's the balance, isn't it? Is the the shiny, exciting versus the really boring but valuable um, project yeah. that you need to work on. And it's hard for people. Like I think all three of us are probably quite interested in all this stuff. So it does get hard to sort of, you know, lay out that sort of prioritization. So it's, I'd, I mean, I think I know the answer to this question, but, um, you know, let's start with you, Jamie. I'm assuming then that work that you did, you know, sort of 18 months ago and all of that implementation, did it make you sort of more or less willing to consider more tech in the future? More. Yeah, always more. Like, I, I'm, yeah, I'm probably on the too far on the more side. Um, <laughs> you know, probably got to strip it back. But but we sort of actually did get to a process. I probably was trying to implement way too much back then. And now we've sort of actually got to a time where we've actually stripped it back a lot. And, you know, Andrew was said earlier on this podcast, there's a lot of noise sometimes and you're doing sometimes a lot of work that's providing the client no value and it's driving up your costs. So that's probably something I've really looked at now is reducing the technology that they're using. But if we're sort of adding it, making sure it's the right thing and sort of going, you know, fully invested into it. So um, yeah, definitely always looking for solutions. And you, Andrew, would you say that you're sort of more willing to, now that you've gone through this process? Yep. <laughs> Now, I should clarify, you're probably not more willing to do what you just did in that entirety again. I'd imagine you never want to do that again. Is that fair? I wouldn't say never because you, you don't know yes. what could change in the future. But I certainly hope that um, – and I'm confident we've picked the right partners through Fin365 right. and Dash that they will continue to evolve and not just sit back once you know they've grabbed market share like some of the more incumbent players have. So I, I'm confident that we've – yeah, yeah, I'm confident we've got the, the right partners with us, but certainly more willing to uh, make changes to our tech in the future because we've now unbundled the CRM from the um, the, the document generation, the modelling, the um, you know the research and everything. So we can make changes to part of our tech stack without having to rip the whole thing up and start again, which is unfortunately what happens when you are using an all-in-one solution. Uh, you don't have the ability to go, well, I don't like that modeling that they do, or I don't like this super comparison software, I'll use something else. Well, you can do it, but it won't talk to each other. Yeah. Right. And you end up duplicating because you've inevitably got it in your, your all-in company sing CRM and probably paying for it. And then you're also paying for a standalone solution as well. Uh, so for us, yeah, it's going to be a lot easier in the future if you know, if we looked at our modeling software and said we don't like it and something else had an API that plugs into the CRM, then it wouldn't be a big job to change it. Well, and also I think for things we can't imagine right now, like who knows where this is all going to go? There could be services we'll all end up, maybe there'll be more life coaching. I don't know what it is. And suddenly we'll need a system that does something completely different. If you've got the core that can talk to other things, then that won't be quite as traumatic. You won't need another new core system. It'll just be like you say, finding the best of breed and plugging it into the ecosystem you already have. Spot on. Um, yeah, which might be a relief <laughs> now that you've done those hard yards. Yep. Um, you know, Jamie, I'm curious for you then, you know, going forward, you know, with the ongoing management of the tech you've got, is there anything you feel you guys could do better? You sort of already mentioned a couple of things, but is there any areas you want to focus on even more to maximize the value you're getting out of that tech? Yeah, reporting is a big one for us. Um, yep. No any good details on that data. So we've sort of just Talk about projects. That's a big project we've sort of just kicked off now is um, using Microsoft to understand sort of the power behind our data um, so that we can track things a lot better. So that's a really big one for us at the moment. Um, but look, something I, I really want to get better at and what I think I've done now is, is got key staff members involved and giving them the responsibility now. So, you know, I think I think the sort of more you scale, the more you need sort of people in charge of a certain area around the technology because they're going to be the ones that make the best informed decision. So, you know, the meeting we had this morning, I didn't say anything because, to be honest, I just hadn't used the technology and I don't have an idea on it. So, you know, I understand the benefits that it can get us, um, but it's up to other people in the business now to to make those decisions and and I empower them to do that and, and take, you know, they, they're, they're the final decision maker. 
um, you know, on that. It's not easy to do though, is it? It's really hard to step back like that. Um, if you're used to being the curious tech person and sort of being the driver of this, it is a very big step to go to, well, I can be a passive listener or even just a, almost a guardrail, just a flag. Hey, have you checked in on this? Or, hey, is that still on vision or on focus? It's very hard to make that transition. Yeah, it is. But I think when we, I was almost forced to, which has been probably the easiest way to do it. Um, you know, if you're sort of still trying to be the person that controls everything, then you're probably just going to create more headaches for yourself and your team. Yeah. And we sort of talked about in previous podcasts, unhappy staff, and that's not where you want to get to. Yeah, absolutely. So, Andrew, for you guys, when you look forward, you know, <clears throat> in terms of the really extracting the value from all this tech you've done, you've done a whole lot of hard work. Um, you know, are there areas you want to focus on to keep optimizing that value? Or is there any sort of further development or other things you're going to do? I mean, you mentioned actually getting a developer from the uh, 365 perspective. What did that come about? Because you feel like there's a lot of value you could get there. There is. Uh, more so for the parts of our business outside of financial planning, though. Okay. It's more so what happens across in the land of you know, our property buyers agency, because fortunately, Fin365 have built out most of what we need in financial advice. A uh, few little nuances and bits and pieces, because everybody's business model is different, hmm. but it's what happens elsewhere. Like when we look at you know, the property, the mortgages, uh, we've got a, a fairly substantial sales and marketing element to our business as well, or um, client engagement and marketing, I should say. Uh, and so uh, some of the things that they do around client engagement journeys and everything uh, requires a bit of development work and then how that handover works as they work through a, 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 an engagement side of things across to us in the financial planning world, yep. um, how the, the data transfers, uh, all those sort of things require a bit of development work. Uh, so that's, that's more so outside of the advice world, um, uh, that, that we'll look at that. Yeah. Okay. And so that's just, yeah. So that's getting the value you're already seeing, seeing in the advice, um, through to the others, you know, in the most extreme sort of way is really making sure that you get as much value as possible. Yeah, absolutely. But also just how we you know, kick off um, things that need to happen with other teams. And you know, if we've got a, a request that comes in from a client and we look and go, you know what, well, that's actually a, it's a property matter. How do we you know, get a workflow across to them that starts and it extracts all the data that we have and yeah. it gets in front of the property people so they can just pick it up and go, great, I know what I'm doing with this client. Let's, well, let's run with it rather than spending hours trolling through you know, the, the client file, trying to understand them, trying to get all of that key information in the right place, get the right dashboards. Um, that's yeah. that's one thing that we really want to work on is um, the sort of the dashboard that each advisor has when they log in so that they can see what their key priorities and tasks are for the day. That's a, that's a key one because otherwise what I find is most people tend to use Outlook as what drives everything they do for yeah. the day and really it shouldn't be. Um, they need to be getting into the CRM and going, right, well, where's each client at? Get out that high level overview and know what activities they need to get through for the day to be most effective, uh, that's probably the next thing that we really need to work on. And even seeing forward to the future as an advisor, you know, how many ongoing service agreements have you got coming up over the next yeah. three months? And how are you planning for that as well? Um, though I think that's, yeah, I agree with those dashboards. It's just vital as that next stage. And I think um, I've had a view that I know is unusual, but I think the figures we use in the industry for the capacity of an advisor are arbitrary. They really are arbitrary and based on your business, how you do it, are you virtual or not? What's the user experience? How many meetings? How many, like all of that defines what the actual capacity of an advisor is. And you're not going to know that until, like you say, you've got those dashboards where you can see what they've got coming up and then can see, well, does that use all their time or doesn't it? You know, like that's what can lead to understanding capacity, you know, and understanding how many advisors you're going to need to serve the sort of business you're trying to build. Yeah, I guess that's a key benefit that I probably should have raised earlier is we now have a lot better understanding of uh, the time and effort that goes into uh, providing advice to our clients and um, the, the cost to serve, which yeah. we didn't have before uh, because it's automatically tracking you know, how many emails are we sending back and forth to these clients throughout the year? You know, how many? How much time are we spending in phone calls with the client? How much time are we spending you know, doing their strategy or in meetings with the client? And it just allows us to better understand the resources we need to be able to advise those clients, price our services appropriately as well, uh, because otherwise we can. We're a fee for service business, and we've got to be careful that we don't end up with clients that are cross subsidising other clients uh, in the way that the fee structure works. So we really want to make sure that 
we are charging appropriately. It's not just the cost to serve though. We also do focus very much on the value that we're providing to the clients when we do um, set our pricing. But um, you know, if the cost to serve exceeds the value that's provided to the client, then you've got a problem where, well, how do you charge the client appropriately and still be in their best interest? Now we can yeah. understand where we might have clients where that problem might be starting to eventuate. Yeah. And yeah, what do we do about it? Do we change the kind of services they're getting? Do we narrow the focus? Do we say to the client, look, here's a set and forget strategy on your way? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it'll be interesting going forward to see how everybody evolves in that sense, you know, and how we adjust our pricing and models and all of that based on um, more information we have. Because that's really what we're saying is you can just got far more in- information and you can know exactly what you need next. I mean, that understanding of the tasks that are going on, like the actual activity is what's defined us getting a portal. Because while security was a wonderful thing, and it, that's a given, we realized that more than half the tasks that the team were working on were follow-up client on and followed by some expression. Yep. <laughs> because And it was just constant follow-up. Well, if you've got an app that sits on somebody's phone and it can notify them, well, that's one less notification, you know, that's one less follow-up a human yep. has to do. You know, so it's so I agree with you. I think all of this, the more information and repetitive information, you know, that can create yeah. data, the more power we have. Yeah, I think so, people expect more uh, updates these days. I mean, you go and do some online shopping and you will get a text message within like an hour that your order's been, you know, been received, it's been fulfilled. Then, you know, like you get six text messages in 48 hours of what's happened. <laughs> yeah. And I, I read somewhere once that you know, basically... People judge their customer service experience relative to the most recent experience they've had. So the problem that we have as advisors is the most recent experience that somebody's probably had is through one of these online businesses where they've ordered something and that you know, that's the kind of information and updates they expect from us is to be updated every step of the way. You know, yeah. we've completed your fact find, it's your modeling's been done, it's now moved on to power planning. That kind of just to see progress. Yeah. Uh because if we get emails from clients and you know, we might have only spoken to them three days ago and they're like, oh, where are we up to with, with the plan? And you know, we told them in the call it's going to take a week or two. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, we'd, we'd like to still be able to say to them, hey, there's progress. Uh, we don't want to bombard them, but at the same time, we want to make sure they're getting updates and manually typing emails, text messages, or making phone calls every time something happens is not exactly, um, it's just, it can't be done just on a, a cost basis. And Jamie, I'm betting you guys have seen that insight though from the mortgage land, right? Because they're much better at that stuff. They've recognized that um, otherwise, well, either you're going to need a second mobile for all the calls you're going to get from clients going, how's your approval? How's your approval? How's your approval? How's your approval? <laughs> or you have a system that sort of helps you do that. Is that what you've seen too? Yeah. Look, I, I think they, they have done really well at industry um, at creating an application where it continuously updates the clients as well. Um, yeah. sort of their portal land is really good, but yeah, one thing you don't want to be doing is sending feedback uh, things all the time because when Australia posts, you know, asks me fifteen times how my uh, delivery was, um, <laughs> you know, you, you you want to sort of do that. But I agree, I mean, the consistent updates of where things are at, and you're right, the client feels like, oh, you know, they're continuously working on my file. They're getting busy. They're doing. I know, you know, I'm paying them for the service, and they they're delivering on that. Um, and you don't have to continuously update them because. Yeah, ongoing service is that funny thing. Like we we all need to sort of see our clients at least a minimum of one time a year. But we know there's so much that goes on in the background and everything that we're doing. So making sure that they're aware of that. You know, obviously you're meeting clients at different more touch points per year. But you know, if we can continuously update on this to the administration process that's going on in the background as well in a clear manner that you know looks like value um, and is value, um, then I think that's good. Perfect. So then oh, it's been a fabulous conversation. So any sort of last tips? So let's start with you, Jamie. Any last tips you give other practices that are sort of really trying to optimize the utilization of technology they've sort of moved to? So they've got it and, you know, it's in that ongoing phase. Is there any other tips you'd give them um, for them to help take advantage of that tech? Yeah, find the time. You know, I know it's a cost to the business. You're not, you're not seeing clients, but, you know, if you take that time and continuously take that time, you'll make it up on the other end. Absolutely. How about you, Andrew? Any last tips for everybody? I think uh, get your staff involved because what we might see as practice principles or or leaders as being the problem or something that needs to be solved is normally what's right in front of us, but it's not necessarily the problem that's in front of your advisors. I'm one person, so if I go and try and spend my time solving a problem that's just for me, am I helping my eight advisors uh, and what they're dealing with or, you know, the the support, you know, two paraphernalias or whatever, it's finding out from them where their lost time is, what do they need, where are the problems they see, and actually focusing on that. Um, 
so that it's you know, better for the business overall. And it builds their trust, doesn't it? Because if you solve the problem that they give you, they're then more likely to share other ideas. You know, also they buy into the solution a lot more if they've been a yeah. part of it. Uh, that's the thing. Whereas it's not being forced upon them; we're we're doing it for them. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Andrew and Jamie, thank you so much for sharing how things have gone since you completed or partially completed your new tech projects. You know, people don't often get an opportunity to hear about things after that initial move. So, you know, I'm confident that this is going to be have been really helpful um, to the listeners who are either considering a new tech selection or even partway through one or just finished one. So thank you, gents, both of you very much for your time. Great thank you very much. Wow, we've got to episode five. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us again. Here you are, Andrew Andrew Wheeling from Dash. <sighs> you know, this stage here is really interesting because I think most of us probably figure once we've implemented the thing, it's done, right? And yay, problem solved. We can all skip off happily <laughs> into the sunset. But, you know, what's What's clear, I think, even in the discussion that that went on earlier, is there's so much value from continually tapping into the upgrades, continually tapping yeah. into new features and making sure you implement them. And it's probably something not many of us are doing well. No, and I've got to say, I, I feel like I feel like sometimes we haven't cracked that either. So what we're really good at is developing features. And I think Andrew said, said as much, we release every two weeks. Right. right. So... And and we want this was this is the new agile way of doing things, and you want to see no, they're not huge releases, but right. it's just incremental necessarily, right? Some yeah. whole modules, but most of the time it's just incremental improvements based on feedback or bug fixes, right? Right. So you want to keep that velocity, yeah, right. But how do you keep how we keep everyone across it is, is something that we're always like I feel like I'm always we're always challenged with is what is that ideal model so yeah you know Andrew says he's borrowed the way that we deal with internally with prioritization meetings yep. about what we're going to build next yep um one of the things that I thought of when I was listening to that is I wonder if we should be in those <laughs> right or someone from fin365 or whoever yeah. it is because we have we we will bother every we we we're happy to be a bother right yeah. to be in people's practices and zoom yeah. in like we love being part of it but yeah well often sometimes people just want us to piss off as well yes. they leave us alone we, we, we've got our own business so it's a really it's a really challenging part to get that right it uh, is. but i think that what we have got right is the culture that we want to help and that yeah. we want we care about the feedback yeah um so i think that's that's first and foremost but then the the model of getting, of get, making sure everyone's making value or getting the most value out of what we're building every fortnight is, yeah. is is hard. It is. And it's, look, I've learned that from a different perspective, which is social media. You know, you'll put a post out on something important. You go, well, when I told everybody, well, you yeah. put it out. Yeah. That doesn't mean anybody's read it. Like, correct. Or absorbed it or implemented it. Yeah, correct. <laughs> And our release notes, we, we, we try really hard. It's, fa- it's fascinating, right? This is on the other side, pulling the curtain right back. Yeah. You know, we, we will often go, you know, the techos will write something and you go, I don't understand. Like, I'll say, I don't understand it. <laughs> what, did, what didn't it do or what does it right. do now or what, right. what does this? So now we, we spend a lot of time actually spelling out what it is in non-technical terms. Yeah. Um, and if that's not being read, <laughs> it's sort of like the old SOA thing. It doesn't right. get read. You put your hard soul into it. So. Yeah. So, you know, we're really keen to to find new and innovative ways to partner properly so people can get across this. But yeah. um, it's di- different businesses are different. You know, they want us involved heavily and, yeah, some, and that's- some are like, just stay out of it and we'll, we'll ring you if you need you. So, it's, yeah. it's interesting. But I think, I mean, even just, you know, they've everybody either has a weekly team meeting or whatever the schedule is, might be fortnightly, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. even just having tech as a line item. Yeah. Great and, ideas. Hey, yeah. well, you know, and, and you might have different advocates in the business for different pieces of tech and, hey, guys, what's the latest thing? You know, what's come up? At least then the practice will be aware of it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But And also you don't have necessarily – if you've got an advocate that's happy to run it, but if you need support, just ask. ask. It will come. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the question, actually, I, I encourage advisors to ask of their tech providers that they have partnered with is, what's the feature you can't believe nobody's using? Like you guys would have some gems there. Like I can't believe nobody picked up on this yeah, one. It's yeah. awesome. It's so good. Yeah. Right. So yep. I, you ask that all the time. I'd yeah. encourage advisors constantly. That's oh. a great question, and we should put it in our. We often have that. That's something very similar to that in our 
like monthly newsletter. Yeah. But again, I have a feeling that a lot of them get deleted. Because <laughs> so, we all get so many. Like exactly. all, the all the providers that you've right. Got. So yeah, it's it's a it's a, it's hard to cut through. But it is. Um, if there's nothing else. Just reach out and ask them to come to a meeting as an yeah. experiment. Yeah, <laughs> and if it doesn't work for you, fine. Absolutely, but. and and give that provider the agenda. Say, yeah. this is what we're looking for. What yeah. are the upgrades been? Yeah. What things do you think people should be taking more of? Like, really, yeah. let them come. Resource. Oh, they'd be our guys would be chuffed. Yeah, they'd be chuffed. Yeah. To come. Now, one of the other things that I was actually a bit fascinated with was, you know, as these practices have been implementing their tech, and some of it had been embedded for a bit, and they'd taken time. They're seeing that the skills they need or the, even the roles they need in the practices has started to evolve mm. because, you know, maybe years past they would needed somebody that was data entry, like focused yeah. on the de- – like so they'd really hired somebody specifically. And now, of course, because the tech is doing some of the, uh, well, much of that for them, they need different skills. Mm. Are you guys seeing that? Is it sort of yeah, evolving? Yeah, we're, we're really trying hard to drive that. So mm. the the one thing that is a real um, they be my bonnet on is – the financial planning process where you have a goals meeting and then you have to wait two weeks to then get a paper like it is 2023 yeah <laughs> that is gone yeah. right that that has to that is broken yeah you cannot we've got to offer and it's not just us but there's lots of tech around this but it doesn't have to be us but either the in the financial planning sector I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement to provide immediate value right. for a client in every meeting, you know, yeah. they walk away with her going, geez, I've learned about me, like my own situation in that meeting. Yeah. So they can walk away happy. And I so the idea that, you know, Jamie's hiring different people because they're doing their own modeling in front of clients and that requires more tech and sales rather than right. back office. Like that's that is the industry, you know. Clearly, they're at the forefront. They're real cutting edge with how sure. they do things. But that's the industry evolving, man. Yeah. I, I just love, I love that, and I think we need it badly. Don't we? Because I think actually we've expected we could hire people that could sort of cope with all things and all facets for years. You know, somebody had to be, and I mean, people don't like the word sales, but it is a lot of what you're doing is certainly comps. It's it's engaging with people and it's building yeah, trust. People, people. Right. So well, we need you to be that, but we also need to be really technical focused and we need you also to be analytical. And yeah. like, actually, if you were to build a human being, very few of them have all of those things. No know, one naturally, does. right? I don't believe it. Right. So, so if actually you know implementing wonderful tech well means you can dive deep into these individual experts, almost you can get yeah. somebody that's really, and that means you're getting rock stars and everything. Yeah, that gets a bit yeah. exciting. It's best. Of, it's this best of breed, right? Right. So that Andrew was talking about. So now we're talking about not only can you get best of breed tech yeah but then if you get all that rolled out you can start hiring best of breed staff yes right and so you're going to have this really diverse it's going to be harder from an hr perspective <laughs> yeah. right so i don't know if you've seen walked into a software house like there's a whole part of our the whole part of our shop that is dead silent so you know there's 30 people in there because <laughs> yeah. headphones coding you right. know that's yep. how they operate so yep. what we're going to see i think is more of that in financial planners is you're going to have like a really diverse you got you're going to have like a a, a people side you're going to have tech people you're going to have coding people potentially you know which is yes. which is nice i think that's that's a good business really good and and what i like about that too is there's therefore different pathways for people mm. you know i mean i i giggled a little actually when andrew was sharing you know we they've now got a a specialist financial modeler right and you know, we might have all said, well, isn't that what a power planner is? Well, yeah. power planners do a lot of document generation it's currently, true. Yeah. right? But if you can have a financial model, I I was a financial analyst back in yeah. many moons ago, folks, many moons. Um, and you got to be very good at that yeah. to the point that you could give insights to senior people yeah. because it's the re- repetition of what you're yeah. seeing or what you're doing, yeah. you know, and that human can have a different career path to then somebody who loves the interacting with the clients and mm. loves seeing them reach their goals and gets revved up about that. You know, like it's how powerful would that be and what a diverse industry we'd end up with. How, how niche is it as well? Like yes. I, I've got to say, I thought I thought that was a fascinating comment and my immediate idea was, is like we go back to in-house power planning, but it's not, you're right. It's you got a maths expert. Right. So you, could, you, you can be confident that not only is the tech good and it's immediate, giving that immediacy, but 
you know the numbers are right yes. and you've you've got someone that can articulate it potentially in a way yeah. that's separate and um you're not wasting time right i think the key part is you're then not wasting time doing something that you are a C grader at, yes. right? Like play your A game eight hours a day exactly. and you're a better business rather than asking Absolutely. people to be, you know. Middling. They're yeah. just middling at Like things. if it were me, I would be a D plus modeler, right? Yeah, and so right. it would take me six hours to do something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so, I, yeah, I love I love that specialist, mm. specialist specialization of labor. <laughs> right. And I think economics. actually we'll probably see that even in advisors. It'll mm. be in in streams of what they focus on, yeah. you know, and, and whether it's whether it's aged care or other. Like I think we will yeah. start to see people who just go deep in things, right. and get really good at it. So I think this will all feed into that, yeah. Which is I hope pretty we do. exciting, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your insights. This has been fantastic, thank and you. I'm really confident the listeners are going to get going to have got some huge value. Thank you, Peter. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>